Yeah. Namaste. Good, mo good morning to the friends from uh, USA and other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world, and good evening to the friends from India. Happy New Year to you all. Uh, Professor Kevin McGrath, today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Gitesh Nirban, co-convener of the webinar series that we have, and distinguished invitees and dear friends who are interested in Mahabharata scholarship. I welcome you all to the 26th session of this series of webinars on Mahabharata as hosted by the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, along with Kamala Nehru College, University of Delhi. These webinars are being organized under the aegis of SPARC project, which is uh, the scheme for promotion of academic and research collaboration, an initiative taken by Minister of Education and Government of India. The title of the project is Yoga Consciousness in Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita, an ethical value for societal and political well-being. We are working as a team in this project along with Professor Vishwa Adluri from Hunter College, City University of New York, USA, who is our international principal investigator, and Dr. Joydeep Bakchi from Germany, who is associated with Hindu University of America as co-principal investigator uh, from uh, uh, international side. And Dr. Gitesh, uh, who is hosting this uh, webinar now for all of us from Department of Philosophy, Kamala Nehru College. Uh, she is the Indian co-investigator of this pro project. And me, Professor Bala, the head of the Department of Philosophy, uh, University of Delhi, as the Indian principal investigator. Our extended team consists of Ms. Jayashri Jha, Ms. Anmol Prithkao, uh, Ms. Megha Kapoor, who are the research scholars at the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, and all of them are working on uh, Mahabharata, uh, the various aspects of Mahabharata for their doctoral work. And we have uh, Ms. Deepshika, who is a postgraduate student supporting us with uh, uh, whatever possible uh, things that are required for the project. As far as our project is concerned, it is a collaborative attempt to revisit the Indian epic to explore yoga consciousness as one of its underlying messages while understanding how dharma as a result of yoga consciousness in Mahabharata can be uh, interpreted well, can well be interpreted for political and societal well-being. This project is a journey through the roadmap of uh, yoga consciousness to delve deeper into ancient mm -hmm. Indian wisdom for reviving the concepts of social responsibility and value embeddedness. It is also a search for answer, answers to the question of right action thus portraying how yoga consciousness in the form of equanimity and equality in Mahabharata emerges as an ethical ideal. To be like, if, you, if we try to look at the pointers of this project, we are trying to look at yoga consciousness in Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita. And we are also trying to focus on ethical values of societal well-being and political well-being that we can derive or draw from the text Mahabharata. Or the focused question that we are dealing with is, what is the right course of action and how to identify it and also how to perform this right course of action after identifying it you now taking hints from the text mahabharata these series of webinars are our humble attempt to make the various aspects of mahabharata reach the diverse audience who hold interest in the study of epic we started this series of webinars uh, during the extreme phase of lockdown to engage minds with mahabharata we have had the privilege of hosting scholars of repute from universities and organizations in India and abroad, wherein diverse topics related to Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita have been touched, ranging from societal and political well being, ethical dilemmas, justice, consciousness, karma yoga, and instrumental violence, humanness in punishment, environmental influences, dialogical consciousness, and many more topics pertaining to the epic all as an attempt to explore Mahabharata from, uh, for the human well-being. We are uh, today very honored to have with us uh, Professor Kevin McGrath, uh, who is presently Associate of the Department of South Asian Studies at Harvard University. He would be speaking to us on three Bharata heroes, Karna, Bhishma, and Krishna in epic Mahabharata. In fact, I must tell you all that we, are, we, we should feel very honored to have him with us because uh, he has written extensively on Mahabharata. I did not find anybody else who has written so much on Mahabharata 
uh, uh, in the recent times. Uh, all these three characters, Bhishma, Karna, and Krishna, so important, and he has written works on each one of them, along with the narrative itself. He wrote on narrative as well, uh, uh, which which is published as a book. So it's really a, a privilege to uh, have uh, have you with us, uh, Professor uh, Kevin. Uh, and without wasting much time, let me request Dr. Gitesh to introduce the speaker uh, uh, and take the proceedings further. Over to you, Dr. Gitesh. Thank you, Professor Bala. Namaskar to all. Wish you all a peaceful and fruitful 2021. For this uh, 26th session of the ongoing series of webinars, we have a renowned name in the scholarship of Mahabharat who has covered the rich diversity of this epic in form of his writings. Yes, Professor Kevin McGrath. Professor McGrath, born in Southern China in 1951, has been educated in England and Scotland. He has lived and worked in France, Greece, and India. Presently, Professor McGrath is an associate of the Department of South Asian Studies and Poet Laureate at Lowell House, Harvard University. As a reputed scholar, he has huge list of publications to his credit. To name a few, Fame 1995, Linus 1998, Meles 2002, The Sanskrit Hero 2004, Flyer 2005, Comedia 2008, Sri 2009, Jaya 2011, Supernature 2012, Heroic Krishna and Eroica 2013, In the Kutch and Windward 2015, Arjuna, Pandava and Eros 2016, Raja Yudhishthira 2017, Bhishma Devrata 2018, Vyasa Redux 2019, Song of the Republic 2020, and the forthcoming title is on friendship, which we all will get to read in 2021. So much work on Mahabharat is to his credit. We are honored and privileged to have him with us on this platform. Professor McGrath lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and here he is with us for the first webinar of 2021 of this ongoing series under the AGs of the Spark Project. So Professor McGrath is going to be delivering an address on, as Dr. Bala just mentioned, three Bharata heroes, Karna, Bhishma, and Krishna in Mahabharat. Welcome to this platform, Professor McGrath. And now I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devrakonda and Dr. Nirban. And uh, thank all of you for inviting me here this evening and for being um, in this room. What I'd like to talk about are three Bharata heroes, Karna, Bhishma, and Krishna in epic Mahabharata. <clears throat> Mahabharata makyanam yapatet susamaheta sagachet paramam sitim itime nasti samshaya. Books one and 18 of the poem make this claim repeatedly. That is how a work of art is able to perfect a human being. And what I'd like to do in the next 50 minutes or so is to investigate this causal relationship between poetry and human perfection or the potential for human perfection. Now, <clears throat> heroes and heroines suffer and die in the Mahabharata and singing about their lives and ordeals possesses both moral and spiritual efficacy. That is what the poem is claiming. And the performance of the epic song is salutary, it's therapeutic, and it's healing for an audience, which given these severe pandemic times which we are experiencing is extremely pertinent. So I'd like to try and analyze this relationship between how a work of art can perfect a human being. And to do, do this, I would like to focus on one word, and that is kirti, K-I-R-T-I, which is how the poem frequently refers to itself. And kirti, we can translate as fame, 
That would be the, the common translation. But this is not a fame that is received in the sense that Hrtik Roshan is famous or Indira Gandhi was famed for her policies. This is a fame that is apprehended. It is something substantial. It is epistemological. It's acoustic, if you like. And the transmission of this kirti is what causes or leads to city, this, this human perfection. So in this process, then, let's look at these three char charioteers who are central to the plot of the poem, Karna, Bhishma, and Krishna, all of whom die by an arrow, which is the weapon of chariot warriors. Now, what is interesting for us, and particularly for you, in your researches, is that all these three heroes express or demonstrate an understanding of or affinity for yogic consciousness. And it is this which I would propose to you, which leads to this production of fame, of kirti, which, as we have just heard, is efficacious. It causes things to happen. It has consequence. So what we're looking at then are these three words, the trajectory of these three terms. That is our tripartite um, narrative for this evening, yoga, kirti, and siddhi. That's what we're going to do. So let's explore this term kirti. <clears throat> and here I have five points, which I would like to develop in the next half hour or so. And the first, of course, concerns what is it? What, what is this genealogy? What, where does Kirti come from? And as you know, the Mahabharata is composed in two fashions. One concerns inspiration and one concerns addition. And inspiration relates to, shall we say, the first half of the first millennium BCE, a time that we refer to as the archaic period, which was also preliterate. There's no writing. Whereas addition concerns the classical era, the first centuries of the first millennium of the common era, um, which is a time of literacy. And it's a time when Hinduism was beginning to develop. So let's look at inspiration to begin with. And there are three poets within the poem who manifest different aspects of inspiration. Vyasa Sanjaya and Vaishampayana. Um, Vyasa is in who produces the first rendering, the first performance of the poem, derives his inspiration from an act of dhyana yoga. Uh, Kavindro dhyanam anvagamat param, the Indra of poets Vyasa pursued the highest dhyana. That is how Vyasa receives his inspiration and that which leaves, leads to the delivery of that first instancing of the poem. Sanjaya, who performs the four Kurukshetra books, receives his inspiration visually. He describes, he sings about what he has seen. And Vaishampayana, who performs most of the poem, receives his inspiration acoustically. He simply recites what he has heard someone else proclaim. He repeats what he has heard. So we have three kinds of inspiration here. Now, to complicate that slightly, these three poets have a temporal distinction. Vyasa never actually engages in direct speech with uh, Vaishampayana. And Vaishampayana's patron or sponsor to whom Vaishampayana is delivering the poem, Raja Janamajaya, never encounters Vyasa at all. And Sanjaya lives two generations before Vaishampayana, and Vaishampayana himself lives two generations before Ugrashavas, who is like the MC. He opens the poem and closes it, that's all. So in terms of inspiration, then we have this extremely complex model. And then concerning addition, our other fashion of genealogy. For me, the, the greatest of all Mahabharata scholars is Vishnu Suktanka. And he was the senior editor who oversaw 
the team who produced the uh, PCE, the Pune Critical Edition, in the middle of the 20th century. And this is the text that I use. And in one of his essays, Suktanka wrote about what he described as the Bhagava recension. That is a group of individuals, members of the Bhargava clan, descended from the Vedic Rishi Burgu, produced this text, a work of edition, sometime in the early years of the first millennium of the common era. And I would actually date this to the fourth century and the time of Samudragupta. So in terms of inspiration and edition then, we have an extremely complicated situation. Now, let's look at our second point, which concerns time in the poem. And time, as you know, in this poem has many beginnings, many middles and many ends. The heroes and heroines, they walk with the deities, they speak with the deities, they dine with the deities, sometimes they make love with the deities, and sometimes they enter into contention or combat with these divinities. And some of these heroes and heroines are not actually human. They have no mortal parents, but they look and behave as human beings and they die. And some of these heroes and heroines are only half human. So in that sense, once again, we have a paradoxical situation because we have the earthly and mundane conjoined with the supernatural and the timeless. We have a strange combination of temporal qualities here. And then secondly, concerning time, the, poet, the poem is not specifically historical. The heroic age is an artificial retrospective synthesis. It's an ideally hypothetical time, and it incorporates at least 1500 years of material and cultural experience, drawing from both the archaic and the classical periods. And this is not simply a work of incorporation or inclusion because there is, also a strongly rigorous activity of exclusion here, what we in the 21st century would refer to as censorship. Events are just not in the Mahabharata, whereas they occurred actually in time. In terms of the core plot, and let me define plot as the causal sequence of events, in terms of the core plot of the poem, we have seven generations from Shantanu to Janamajaya. But once again, there's a complexity because the poem begins with the ritual and terminates with the ritual. That is, it moves in a circular fashion, what we refer to as ring composition. And the poem begins, in my beginning is my ending. And that is how this ritual closes the poem. It is as if you went to a cinema in Delhi tonight and the film opened with a scene, say a robbery. And then the rest of the film concerned the events which led up to that scene of the robbery. And then the film closed with the robbery being repeated. It's what in cinema studies is called a flashback. And that is how most of the poem Mahabharata, the great Bharata is delivered. And then, we have many simultaneous narratives running in the poem. Um, not simply the master narrative and the many micro narratives which have been attached at various points and merged into this master narrative, but many dimensions and aspects of time are joined together, which is almost irrational. Time, you have diurnal time, you have stellar or astronomical time, you have cosmic time, the yugas, you have sacrificial time, and you recall that the poem is delivered during this long rite, this long ceremonial rite, and it is delivered during the pauses in that rite. And there is the time of pilgrimage, where a pilgrimage of a year is compressed into five or 10 lines. And then in the Kurukshetra books, you have perhaps the only sequence of days, day one, day two, day three, day four, mundane time, diurnal time. And in the Kurukshetra books, you have a vast preponderance of simile. Something like 60% of, of the poetry in these four books is composed by simile. So if I said, Dr. Gitesh is looking like a lioness this evening, 
Well, in 10 years time, Dr. Kitesh will be 10 years older, but that lioness will still be the exactly same lioness. Similes are timeless. So <clears throat> what we have then is this visionary, and shall we call it an irrational world where heroes and heroines move among various multifarious kinds of duration sequentially. And what we perceive as an audience or as readers is a synopsis of all possible knowledge and experience and this vast array of the dimensions and aspects of time, of duration in a single conception of narrative conditions. Now, this is what I would propose to you is akin to what a yogi experiences as he or she proceeds through practice towards a state of samadhi. This condition where all knowledge, all experience, all the qualities and aspects of time are available. Um, and you see this in Krishna's three theophanies in the poem, particularly in the Gita and the first one in the Vanapavan, where you have this absolute registry of all possible experience, time, knowledge, and even possible fiction. So those are my first two points concerning Kirti. One, concerning its genealogy, and two, concerning how the poem manifests its representations of time. Now, let's turn to our first hero and our third point. This is Kana, and for me, Kana, as you know, is the Sanskrit hero. There's no one quite like Kana. He is the superhuman ancient Indo-Aryan solar hero. And he should be the true king, but he has been displaced and rejected from the lineage by his mother. Now, what interests us this evening is that Kana is a hero of speech. He has a particular disposition towards the quality and efficacy of language. And this concerns, for Kana, the medium of heroic discourse itself, Kirti, the epic poem, the epic song, which for Kana has a material permanence. That speech has durability. And Kana's passion to be involved in that medium of heroic discourse, to be recalled and to remem be remembered for his deeds is a, tr a transcendental passion. It takes him out of life. He doesn't care about dying. What he wants is this, this position, this status within heroic memory. And in that process, the speech of Kana, his personal word, is therefore irrevocable. When Kana says something, that's, those words are changeless. His speech is durable as far as Kana is concerned. Um, and you can see this in book five when Krishna comes to him and says, offers him paramount supremacy, you could be king. And Kana says, no, I have submitted my verbal declaration to Duryodhana, to Raja Duryodhana, that is my fidelity. And in book three, where Indra comes to him, wanting to obtain his earrings and his kavacha, his, his magical breastplate, because Kana has previously declared that as a good Kshatri, he will always honor a request. So he takes the, his knife and visibly removes this, these magical earrings and this kavacha, which made him invulnerable and offers them to Indra therefore making himself likely to be killed by Arjuna. He is no longer invincible because of this congenital armor. And similarly with Gatotkacha, when the Rakshasa is attacking his army and they come to him saying, save us Kana, this, we're going to be destroyed. Kana utilizes this very special missile, which he has been reserving for the death of Kana, for the, for the death of Arjuna, sorry and discharges it and destroys Gatotkacha and saves the army. But he's lost that weapon, so it becomes more vulnerable to Arjuna, which doesn't really trouble Kana. He is concerned with the durability, the permanence, the irrevocable quality of his speech. 
he, as a hero, he is a hero of speech. And even though Karna doesn't express or demonstrate any interest in yogic practice, what we have here, and I would submit to you, is a behavior that is, demonstrates vairagya or asaktabuti, these terms that Krishna uses in the Gita, vaira, vaira, vairagya being detachment and asaktabuti being that person whose mentality has no inclination. Karna is detached from all fruition. What he is concerned with is this, is this durability, this substantial quality of his language. And to take that point uh, one step further, in the Adyoga Pavan, Karna speaks about the Shastri Yajna, the sacrifice of weapons, which is one of the three royal rituals in the poem. The other two being the uh, Rajasuya or the Abhisheka, the anointment of the king, and the Ashvamedha, the, the horse sacrifice. And in this speech, the situation is that the hero and the driver, Karna and Krishna, are on a chariot just before, are stationed on a chariot just before the battle commences, which of course is a mirror of what is happening in the Gita. But here it is Karna who is initiating Krishna into the mysteries, and he's doing this with language. And what happens is that Karna visualizes battle as this orthoprax Vedic fire ritual in which the heroes as metaphors are various kinds of priests and the paraphernalia of warfare, the weapons, the chariots and so on, are the instruments of the ceremony. And these heroes and their, their weaponry are offered into the sacred fire of combat and death. Now let's quickly define ritual here as a symbolic reenactment of how the universe functions. That's how Let's let that be how we understand ritual for the next 40 minutes or so. And just as witnessing a solemn rite for the participants or for the sponsor is edifying, it produces ideally moral and spiritual uh, benefit. So too, according to Karna, listening to the poem, listening to the, this kirti possesses such efficacy. And just as in the ritual, the libations are offered into Agni, the fire, so the metaphors of combat and death are offered into the fire of language, the books of the Kurukshetra, what we refer to as the Bharata. Now, to illustrate this, let me read to you a few lines from uh, the Udyoga Pavan, towards the end of the Udyoga Pavan, towards the end of the 139th Adhyaya. And this is Karna addressing Krishna on the chariot. And he begins by saying, hey Janardana, I cannot behave falsely towards Duryodhana, the intelligent son of Dhritarashtra. He has given his word. That speech is inviolable. It is permanent, it's durable. And then he says to, to Krishna, conceal this our discourse. This is private, this is secret, this is a mystery. And he continues, if Yudhishthira comes to know that I am the firstborn son of Kunti, he will not accept the kingdom. Let Yudhishthira of virtuous soul be king forever. And then he describes this Shastra Yajna, the sacrifice of arms. You, Janardana, will be the Upadashtra, and the office also of the Advaryu will be yours. And Bibatsu, uh, Arjuna, will be the Hotar, and his Gandiva bow will be the sacrificial label. And the prowess of the warriors will be the ghee, the butter, which is to be consumed by the fire. The particular mess missiles, Aindra Pashupata and Stunakana, which are applied by or discharged by Arjuna, will be the mantras of the sacrifice. And Abhimanyu will be the chief Vedic hymn, the Chandas, to be chanted. The destroyer of elephant ranks, mighty Bhima, will be the Udgata and the Prashtota. And let Raja Yudhishthira himself be the Brahma of the sacrifice. And Nakula and Sahadeva will be the slayers of the animals. And their arrows, the ones which have the calf's tooth head, 
will play the part of the spoons and the tamaras, the javelins, will be the vessels of soma and the bows will be the pavitras, the, 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 the fans. The swords will be kapalas um, and the blood of the warriors will be this, this ghee, this butter offered into the fire. And then he says, Dhritarashtra's son, Raja Duryodhana, shall be installed as the Yajamana, the performer, the sponsor of the ritual. And the vast army, the Dhritarashtras, will be his wife. And then Karna begins to close the discourse. When, Krishna, you see me destroyed, felled by Arjuna, that will mark the punaschiti, the beginning of the termination of the ritual. And he closes by saying, hey, Janardana, as long as the hills and the rivers will last, so long will the fame of these achievements, the Bharata, last. And the Brahmanas will recite this great war of the Bharatas. Their fame is the wealth of Kshatriyas, the wealth that Kshatriyas own. And then he returns to his initial statement, Krishna, hey, Kesh Keshava, keep this discourse forever secret. This is private between you and I. So that is the, this remarkable speech which Karna delivers to Krishna stationed on the chariot just before battle. And here you see, just like the Vedic ritual possesses efficacy, so too, according to Karna, with his understanding or his insight into the, the, uh, the force of language, epic poetry possesses efficacy, which is what we began with. Sagachet Paramam Siti, this human perfection, which is what books one and book 18 repeatedly proclaim. So listening to the poem is like witnessing the ritual. Both transport the audience towards this timeless situation. And the performance here, according to Karna of Kirti, creates mental, emotional, and spiritual equilibrium for an audience. Paramam Siddhim. Now, one footnote. Unlike modern 21st century cinema or modern prose novels, in the great Bharata, there is no pain. There is a lot of violence, there is much death, but there is no pain. Whereas in cinema today or in novels today, pain is quite graphically and vividly um, portrayed, sometimes repulsively, sometimes almost pornographically. And in the Mahabharata, death is not repugnant or disgusting. It is actually rendered beautiful through metaphor and sim simile. So when Karna talks about battle, it's not like battle in 21st century cinema or in, in prose novels. Now, let us turn to our second hero, heroic Bhishma, whom for me is the paramount warrior in the poem who defeats all other warriors. And he even defeats the arch guru of heroes, the Bhagavad Rama Jama Dagya. He is the only lineal Kuru. And when he expires, that lineage terminates and the descendants of Yadu move towards the thrones of Hastinapura and Indraprastra. Like his rival Karna, Bhishma is also a displaced elder, eldest son. Like Vyasa, his stepbrother, they both originate from rivers, from the Ganga and from the Yamuna. Like the Pandavas, he is half human, for one of his ancestors, one of his parents is a divinity. And his name, Devavrata, indicates someone who possesses uh, a verbal quality which is divine. And his name, Bhishma, is something which comes from the sky. It's not, a, it doesn't originate terrestrially. Because when Bhishma, as you know, pronounced his, or announced his uh, renunciation, there was this voice in the sky saying, Bhishma, Bhishma, terrific, terrific. And this renunciation, this celibacy, this chastity, this virginity is a paradox because it is Bhishma who oversees many of the marital alliances for the clan. He is the one who uh, provides the brides for the young princes. 
Um, he is the one to commission Vyasa to inseminate the widows of uh, Vichitravira and Chitrangata, which produces uh, the two young princes, Pandu and Dhritarashtra. And Bhishma is the only one in the poem to discourse upon the Dharma of marital alliance, the, the taxonomy of how marriage is to be performed or marriages are to be performed. And his Bhaga, his appointed enemy in battle is Shikandi, who is not simply chaste, but asexual. So you see the modeling here. And Bhishma finally is the ideal king for during his regency, when the princes are still young boys, the poets describe quite extensively this perfect kingdom of Bharatavasha, where all Dharma flourishes and Dharma is in complete equilibrium for a time. And when that regency terminates, that closes. And Vyasa comes to Bhishma and says, be careful Bhishma, life is changing. So let's quickly rehearse our three points so far. We talked about three qualities of Kirti. We talked about its origins, its genealogy, and mentioned the practice of Vyasa, where he uh, behaves with in a fashion of dhyana yoga. That's how he was inspired. We talked about time in this polytropic, synoptic, um, multi-dimensional form of where all the dimensions and aspects of time and human experience and human knowledge are incorporated in one master narrative, which we said was akin to what the yogi experiences on his or her route towards samhadhi. And then we looked at Karna and talked about his understanding of language and his practice of language, um, demonstrating vairagya and one who is asakta bhuti, and looked at how for Karna, battle is itself is a metaphor which has just like the Vedic ritual or the fire ritual, uh, beneficial consequences. Now let's return to that first term, that first word which we looked at, dhyana, because to my knowledge, this word occurs in Indian literature, in, in Sanskrit literature for the first time in the Mahabharata. Um, Kavindro, Dhyanam Anvagamat Param, the Indra of poets, Vyasa, pursued the highest dhyana. So if you do a word search for that term, dhyana, throughout the poem, you will see that it only occurs a few times and only in relationship with Bhishma and Krishna, which is extremely telling. And more than that, when these two warriors are performing their dhyana, they are able to communicate telepathically with each other. Such is the force of this practice. And Krishna says in uh, book 12, Maam Dhyati Purusha Vyagras, that Purusha, that tiger of men, that Bhishma is meditating on me. And in the same book, the poets describe Bhishma as being as prada, uh, Krishna Pradadyao, he meditated on Krishna. They communicate telepathically telepathically, and they are the ones to whom this term is limited to in the poem. Now, that is extremely interesting for us because Bhishma and Krishna are the two figures in the poem to dominate the plot. And let's return to that definition of plot being the causal sequence of events. And plot in the Mahabharata is about 40% of the poetry. It's about 40% of the poem. So let us move to our fifth and final point then and see how Bhishma and Krishna dominate this plot. So firstly, Bhishma. Bhishma in the poem is generally a moral force. And this is a paradox because he is a silent moral authority in many cases. He's the paramount warrior, and yet he is this superlative renunciant. And in his wonderful little book, the great Indian novel, Shashi Tharoor, cast this Bronze Age hero into the 20th century, into the character or role of the Mahatma Gandhi, capturing that sensibility. 
And Bhishma is the first in the poem to propose Beda, partition, dividing the kingdom into two principalities. Bhishma is the one after the Rajasuya, the consecration of the king, to offer the guest gift, the Agya, to Krishna, which troubles the kings who are present, leads to violence, leads to bloodshed, which pollutes the ritual. And in the Harivamsa, the poets say that it was this, this wrecked ritual, this, this polluted ritual, which actually was the sufficient condition leading to the destruction of the kingdom, um, Kurukshetra and the destruction of the kingdom. And Bhishma is silent during the corrupt dicing match. He is silent during the abjection of Draupadi. He is silent concerning Karna's paternity, which only he and Krishna know about. And he is silent almost always when Duryodhana, Raja Duryodhana delivers these hubristic, belligerent, um, truculent speeches. And finally, when Shikandin approaches him, encounters him in battle, Bhishma lays down his weapons, his weaponry, and is in a sense practicing ahimsa, despite being the most invincible warrior. And it is this submission of Bhishma which leads to his death and leads to combat in the battle, turning in favor of Raja Yudhishthira, who triumphs and ultimately secures the throne. So concerning heroic Krishna, he is the superlative charioteer in the Mahabharata. And he is the only one to discourse upon the art of charioteering. And charioteering in this culture is an extremely high status extremely skillful um, elite occupation. And for me, this portrait of Krishna in the great Bharata is the best portrait of a late Bronze Age chariot warrior that we have in all literature. I don't know uh, of another uh, such succinct and wonderful portrait. Now, concerning the plot, the, it is the matrilineal Yadava clan who succeed after uh, the Pandavas has deceased with Parikshit on the throne at Hastinapura and Vajra, whom I think is a nephew of Krishna on the throne at Indraprastha. And these two young princes are genetically more Yadava than anything else. And in terms of kinship, what we have in the poem is a a dual kingship, what is sometimes referred to as diarchy, which is this very ancient mode of kingship where the office of the ritual office of the king and the strategic office of the king are separated. Yudhishthira is the ritual king who practices oversees ritual in the kingdom and Krishna is the, the, the figure who oversees strategy. Um, it is Krishna who supports the building of the Sabha at Indraprastha, where so many calamities occur. It is Krishna who supports the paramount ritual of kingship and of, of the Rajasuya. He is the uh, senior ambassador to the court of Hastinapura just before battle. He is the one in book 12 who actually anoints Yudhishthira, Raja Yudhishthira in the second Abhisheka. Um, and in terms of tactics, it is the design and work of Krishna, which conduces to the death of Bhishma, Gatotkacha, Karna, and ultimately Duryodhana. So those are our five points. Now let's try and bring all this into some kind of resolution. Yagachet. Yapatet Mahabharatam Sagachet Paramam Sitim. Whoever recites or reads or performs or attends to this great Bharata, that person would go to the greatest perfection. That's what books one and 18 repeatedly claim in one form or another. And it is this causal relationship between the poem and human perfectibility, which I hope we have examined in the last 30 or so minutes by focusing on this one term, kirti, which is how the poem frequently refers to itself. Kirti being something epistemological, 
something acoustic, think something substantial. And in this process, we looked at these three hearers and we examined how the origin of the poem lies in an act of inspiration, which is charged by the performance of dhyana yoga. We looked at time and saw how all these multitude of combinations of all possible time and knowledge and human experience are joined in this polytropic synoptic master narrative. We looked at Karna and discussed how his prepossession with language leads him to practice vairagya and the be, become and demonstrate the quality of one who is a saktabuddhi. And we saw how for Karna this verbal form of battle, where battle is delivered in metaphors, has moral and spiritual efficacy. And then we return to the, our first point about dana, dhyana and saw where it can, occurred in the poem and how those occurrences are deeply connected with how the plot of the poem is generated. And then we looked at some of the aspects of that plot vis-a-vis -vis those two heroes. So for Karna, his moral transcendental ambition for permanent, durable, perfected speech leads him to a practice of vairagya and asakta buddhi. And for him, battle becomes a metaphorical ritual with spiritual consequence. For Bhishma, there is this observation of ahimsa and renunciation. And for Krishna, Krishna possesses this unique form of buddhi uh, demonstrated by the three theophanies, particularly the one in the Gita. And he is also a teacher of yoga in various places throughout the poem. So what I hope I have demonstrated to you or illustrated is how the presence of yoga is intrinsically active at the very heart of this kind of heroic discourse, the great Bharata, or how the great Bharata refers to itself as Kirti. And the experience of Kirti for an audience is therapeutic, it's healing. And it is this presence of yoga in the, the poem which charges the delivery of this language, this poetry, with a quality of extraordinary beauty and artistry. So to close then, let us say that it is this compounding of yogiana with epic poetry, which generates what we mentally, morally, and spiritually apprehend as the beneficial universe of Kirti. That is the specific sound where heroes live, suffer, and die. And finally, to revisit that concluding line of Karna, as he's stationed on the chariot with Krishna before battle, hey Janardana, as long as the hills and rivers will last, so long will the fame of these achievements continue. And the poets gloss that word fame as Kirti Baba Shabda Shashvatoyam, Kirti Baba Shabda Shashvatoyam, this perpetual sound that is the existence of Kirti. Kirti Baba Shabda Shashvatoyam. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Professor Magrath, and thank you, Dr. Bala. I think Professor Magrath brought before us an academically stimulating thought of perceiving yogic dhyana in light of three heroes of the epic while explicating how the moral agency gets attached with these three characters. How beautifully he tried to maneuver through uh, these academic words and brought his whole address in line with the very theme of our ongoing project on yoga consciousness. Well, all these theory, uh, all these heroes that uh, he talked about with the power of language, knowledge and action definitely exhibit a combination of emotions and spirituality culminating into mental equilibrium, which undoubtedly is a significant virtue for all of us in the present situation in the world. 
Professor Magrath, you said that the performance of this epic song is salutary, therapeutic, and healing for an audience. Yes, it is. And this is something that our younger scholars can really take back from your words today, understanding that this epic has a lot to offer to the world, especially in the light of the present situation when most of us have been grappling with this external and internal chaos caused by the play of COVID-19. And we really need to get the renewed uh, luminosity to the epic back. And that's what we are trying to do through the series of these webinars under the aegis of the Spark Project. Professor Magrath, thank you on behalf of the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, Department of Philosophy, Kamla Nehru College, our whole team of Spark Project. You've spared so much time for us right early in the morning. We are full of gratitude to you for this. I mean, uh, I, uh, no words can actually express how thankful we are that you gave us time for the first webinar of 2021 under this uh, ongoing, uh, under the edges of this ongoing project. Thank you, Professor McGrath for being with us. I thank all our participants for being there for Professor McGrath's uh, address today. I thank all our participants, particularly for making this whole series a real success. It's with your presence and with your participation that we get a real consistent encouragement to organize a webinar every Saturday. Yes, leaving apart few Saturdays where we all also wanted to take a break and give you also a break. Thank you for being with us. I now request uh, all our participants to switch on their cameras so that Professor Magrath gets to see you all and we can take screenshots. So Professor Magrath, you get to see all our participants now. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so very much, Dr. Devarakonda and Dr. Nirvan, and thank everyone, all of you there this evening in Delhi or wherever you are, um, for participating in this and for these wonderful questions. And I hope the Mahabharata will lead us through this dreadful time which we are now experiencing. Um, so, good night and good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Thank you, my God. Thank you. Good night from okay. India Bye. to all in India and a very good morning to everyone in the US. Namaskar. Namaskar.